Judith, a pleasure to be here. It's always great to talk with Judith, and you'll understand why very shortly if you've never met her before. Or if you've never read her books, you'll feel like you'll know her after you speak with them, or uh, speak with her and after you've read some of her books. Um, as I usually do for my show, I always prepare a little bit of an opening to set the stage. First of all, let me ask, can you hear us in the back? I know we're not amplified. You're, you're good. Okay, so let us know if you don't. Uh, there are a couple of seats here if you do want to move up. Um, New York and Chicago were great laboratories for skyscraper design in the 19th and 20th centuries. But now, emerging cities of the far and Middle East are breaking new ground and reaching new heights. Dozens of super tall and mega tall buildings will arise there in the next decade. Judith Dupre's first skyscraper book was published in 1996. She's now updated that work with a survey and homage to skyscrapers, a history of the world's most extraordinary buildings. I think you're going to agree with me, this book is physically breathtaking. The photographs of these structures will leave you speechless. But the triumph here is not only that Judith captures the monumental scale of the new super talls, not only does she discuss construction details, not only does she include historical context, profiles of the building's architects, and honest discussion of the challenges and the solutions faced to create these super talls in some of the Earth's most challenging environments, Judith captures the personalities of these gigantics and makes her readers, like me, someone who formerly just looked up, really care about these buildings as living, pulsing, organic entities, not just steel, concrete, and glass. This isn't the first time Judith has accomplished this feat. Reading monuments and churches, two of her earlier works, changed me enormously. I never pass a monument now without thinking about the constituent group that formed to champion that statue or arch. I never pass a church without softening my heart for the many who seek and achieve solace there, even though it may not be my house of worship. Judith is now immersed in her latest project, writing the biography of one World Trade Center. I'm so pleased she's able to be with us today to talk about skyscrapers, the history of the world's most extraordinary buildings, and I think you will be too. Welcome. Well, thank you. Well, it's heartfelt. <laughs> Writing an introduction for Judith is very easy for me. <laughs> Let's start our conversation. People have been, have been waiting, and many of you are architects and probably know a great deal more about buildings than I do, so you'll have to bear with me. Last week, we saw something quite extraordinary with oh. two window washers dangling from One World Trade Center. Yeah. And fortunately, everything turned out great, but we were all holding our breath. But the question that many people, including myself, asked, but many people were asking the same thing, is why are we using window washers? Aren't there robots who, that could clean those windows? And the answer came in many different forms, but one from a curator who was quoted in the New York <coughs> Times as saying, buildings are starting to look like huge sculptures in the sky. And of course, there was an explanation about how complicated these buildings are and why the window washers need to do a, a better job than robots could, yeah. and also to identify and repair uh, certain problems. But it occurred to me that these are not just buildings now. They are far, far more. Let's start with a little bit of history. Judith, what was the first skyscraper, the first modern skyscraper? Oh, I thought you were asking about my first skyscraper, <laughs> which was the John Hancock in Boston. <laughs> that, fantastic uh, building by Henry Kopp. That was a magical moment for me when I first saw a skyscraper. A uh, lot of disagreement. Now, people in New York would disagree with this, but Chicago claims the first skyscraper, the home insurance building, which sadly is no longer with us. Um, and if, if, if it were in our midst today, we'd probably we'd walk by it without even noticing it, because it wasn't very tall. It was only 10 stories tall. But what made it the first skyscraper is that it had, it was built around a steel cage. And that was the enabling technology that allowed buildings to go up. So we'll give that, we'll give that one to Chicago. Okay, Chicago <laughs> started, the, started the world there. But wasn't it also the creation of an elevator that enabled buildings to go higher and higher? Well, well lots of forces came together. Mm -hmm. You know, Elijah Otis was smart enough to realize, or people, people get very grumpy after six flights up. Does anyone live in a walk-up? 
I was on a sixth floor walk up at one point here. Um, people get grumpy. They don't like to go, they don't like to climb more than six flights of stairs. So Otis's fortunes rose uh, along with the building. <laughs> <laughs> but there was a lot, there was a lot of other things happening. And more profoundly, um, people were moving into cities. You know, we were going from an agrarian, at the end of the 19th century, we're going into an agrarian, uh, we're leaving an agrarian economy and going into uh, a white collar economy. Um, so people were coming to cities and they needed to be placed somewhere and they needed light. I mean, they need light, you need light to do paperwork. Um, if this is something that's of interest to you, Daniel Bluestone's book on uh, Chicago is a magnificent, tells that story in a magnificent way. And it's interesting to think about what was happening here in the 19th century and compare it to what's happening at this very moment in China, where we have this same rush of people. Um, tens of millions of people are leaving farmland and coming into cities, and they're building like crazy to, to house these people. It's a blank slate as we were. Um, 125 years ago. A century ago, of course. Yeah. Um, what was people's reaction to the higher buildings? I mean, we laugh now at a six-story building or a ten-story building being right. called a skyscraper, right? Right. But height is relative. Uh, it's it's relative. <laughs> but also, if you have never, an, if you're coming from an agrarian situation and then you encounter a ten or twelve-story building, that had to be enormously daunting. Yeah. What was did people embrace this wholeheartedly? Did they, were they willing to work in buildings like this? Well, they were willing to work in the buildings because it was work, for starters. People needed the jobs. Um, there there uh, are some wonderful images of the Metropolitan Life Insurance Building when it went up. People were afraid it was going to fall down. And so the newspapers very helpfully would include diagrams of exactly how it was going to fall. So this kind of fed. You know, they were they were all inspiring structures. They were huge. Hmm. Well, now buildings are truly huge. Yes. I mean, we're talking about a mile high building. Yes. Do does the media still foment fear that they might topple or? Well, I think we can tell by last week with the with the window washers. Hmm. They were, they were no bigger than ants on on the facade of the building, and everyone was holding their breath. I personally was yelling at my television saying. Do not, <laughs> do not fall. Now, in fact, there were four cables holding that scaffolding up. And what was funny was the day after this, I had drinks with Pat Boy, who's the head of the Port Authority, and he said what you couldn't see in those photographs um, was that you know we had the FDNY inside ready to saw that glass out and suck them in, but also on another scaffolding ready to come down was the the police department. Um, EMR, Port Authority folks, you know, it was like, there will be heroes today. And so, anyway, luckily they were saved. No martyrs, fortunately. Thank God. Yes. It was interesting, because people suddenly, there was this, um, you know, everyone has watched this building go up. There's so much energy around that building that I, I was stunned at how many stories there were on the window washers. I don't know if you were. Oh. The world was captivated. We certainly were in New York. What also surprised me, and I, I worry about this, they had to cut out a pane of glass. Now, I don't know much mm. about construction of buildings, but I wondered if that in some way damaged the integrity of a building to cut out this fabulously expensive. Very glass. fabulously expensive, but they're actually units. And they're actually, the units are 13 and a half feet high, and forgive me, I could be a real geek when it comes to numbers, mm. but they actually are individual units. So it's possible, yes, they lost a very expensive unit, but that can be, it can be taken out and replaced. And it, without damaging the integrity of the building? No, no, no. Amazing. Yeah. Just amazing. People learned a lot about glass that day. Um, <laughs> well, I think glass is actually a fabulously <laughs> interesting topic, and it's a whole other subject, but if yeah. you've been to Corning, you'll see some of the things that they are doing these days, yeah. and you're going to find wraparound glass and uh, floating glass, a yeah. lot of very interesting things that are enabling more and more of these kinds of buildings. Yeah. Um, to happen. What would you say is the world's tallest building now? Oh, Burj Khalifa. In Dubai. Know. Burj Khalifa in Dubai. Um, and how formerly the Burj Dubai, but then they got bailed out by the Sheikh Khalifa, so now it's the Burj Khalifa. Okay. And it's the, it's, um, it's the tallest, but it is ready to cede its title. You know? Um, I 
uh, when I was writing the 2008 update to the book, um, a Adrian Smith, formerly of SOM, Adrian Smith was the lead designer on um, the Burj Khalifa, and then he left to start his own uh, firm. And I asked him, what's it like to design the world's tallest? Because you know someone is going to be nipping at your heels in just, you know, in, in a matter of moments. And he said, you know, we know for sure we have five years, because that's the amount of time it is going to take to build the foundations and bring a building of that size up. But now he's designing the Kingdom Tower, tower in uh, Jeddah, and that's going to be the first building to break the mythic thousand meter mark. Now, is so there'll be a new tallest is soon enough. Just a small group of architects who are applying for the jobs of designing the tallest, the very tallest. Or does, is that something that every architect aspires to? I think everyone aspires to it, um, but it is a very, uh, I would say, an elite group of firms that design the very, the very tallest. With Skidmore Owens and Merrill being up front with I, at least a dozen of the world's tallest, it's a, it's a, they are very, very complex undertakings, and they require um, not just structural know-how, but you really need to know um, ground conditions, and you need to know building codes. There's all kinds of things that go that go into it. But what is interesting, one thing you can say about skyscraper designers and engineers is they are by and large Americans. Now the skyscraper is the only American export, architectural export we've ever had. Are we training? That's our, our claim to fame. Are we training architects in other parts of the world here? We're building them in the Far East. Right. And in China. And in China. So are we training their architects to do the same, or are they just relying on American or Western I think architects? the Americans are taking the lead, but then there's plenty of um, local mm -hmm. talent. Is there resistance at all in the Far East to these huge structures that are so dramatic in the landscape that exists? You know, I, I couldn't give you specific examples, but I will say people are, um, certainly in China, are flooding, are flooding cities. And so the skyscraper is, um, it's really a, a means of land development is what it is. Um, there's good old Burj. Um, for instance, controlled by the state, um, a developer will be given um, a skyscraper, mm -hmm. and in exchange for building that, they'll be given se several smaller parcels around it. So it really becomes a mechanism for land development, which is an interesting thing. Same thing happened um, in, in Dubai. Okay. And perhaps there isn't the same culture of opposition or protest that exists elsewhere. Well, it's China. That, that's China. I, I read in the New York Times today <laughs> that there's a lot of uh, discomfort in Paris over the suggestion of a new skyscraper, a mm. triangle skyscraper. Mm. Uh, and there's um, a proposed picture of it in the paper today. And it just surprised me. And then I remembered what happened at the Louvre when they proposed the addition and how controversial that was. But yet I thought, here's a Western city. A skyscraper is going to cause such angst. Yeah, apparently it does assault sensibilities there. Let's talk a little more about the book. This is, if you haven't seen this book, please take some time to review it today. It is just physically beautiful. Mm -hmm. how, many, how many buildings, si skyscrapers, are featured in the book? I think about 70 in this new edition. Okay. And What's how many did you look at to choose 70? Oh, dozens and dozens and dozens. The idea is, it, the idea, you know, it's, um, it's interesting to put together these books because they are, uh, you know, we're looking for the great, the great landmarks, but if you put in, you know, the Chrysler building, which is a beloved skyscraper, you can put in another building that's less, less well known. Let's say the uh, Cocoon Tower in, in Tokyo, which is uh, designed by Tange and Associates. You know, it's, it's a kind of this, it's maybe more of an art than a science. I take the old chestnuts and then I leaven them with the un more unusual structures. Um, what, what was interesting about that very first edition, which came out in 96, Black Dog and Leventhal published it, um, there had been several books that I leaned heavily on. Um, certainly, Carol Willis's very fine book. Um, Ada Louise Huxtable's great book on skyscrapers. Paul Goldberger's great book on skyscrapers. Um, so there were a number of wonderful books, but what we didn't have, and apparently we needed, was a book that would physically conjure the awe that these structures inspire. And so 
we came up with this oversized format at Barnes and Noble promptly said, too big, we're not carrying it, it's a nightmare. It's a library, all my books are librarian, not librarian's nightmares, it's like all of them. But anyway, and they <coughs> luckily Barnes and Noble uh, said, you know, changed their mind. But when this, when we were working on this book in 94 and 95, this is hard to believe, the average person was not online yet. And so one of the things that was, is very interesting to me is how people read. And the book is designed not so you can't see it so much in this edition, but in the very earliest edition, we really um, what I tried to do with Alison Russo, who was the original designer, is to recreate how people, or at least speak to, how people actually read. How do people absorb information? So there are tiny there are tiny glyphs, and there's information bars, and there's deep captions, and there's a giant photograph of a skyscraper, which is why the building was so big, we needed to accommodate. You know, it's hard to create awe if the skyscraper in your book is only this high, right? So um, there was a lot happening on the page. Mm -hmm. It was very kaleidoscopic. And then people got online, and it's interesting. It just it changed, uh, changed the meaning of the design of that original book. Now, what changed it from a black and white book to a color book? Well, you know, that was out of my hands. I kind of love black and white, but, um, you know, bigger and better, that's the way you have to do it with skyscrapers. Mm. So it's a little bit taller and a little bit fatter, and it's all in color now. So Now, as you selected the, the buildings you're going to feature, call them buildings, skyscrapers, they have personalities, they're mega talls, super talls. Yeah. How did, what was your criteria? What made a building make the cut? Some, I, I look for buildings that can add a significant uh, voice to the, the overall conversation. Really, I mean, it, you, you, um, and there's also there's they are um, these are beloved structures. I'm, I'm sure most of you could go through the book and could identify at the least half, tower. if not more, the cupcake tower. The shard, the cheese graters. I, I have to say, I'm a little fascinated by the cheese graters. Everyone know that story that London. Well, it's it's a it's a, it's a, a London skyscraper that you know it's unfortunately been positioned in such a way that sunlight hitting it, basically tasing people on the ground. I mean, we're also it's also happening here at the National Museum. There's a bad skyscraper down there that's you know frying everyone in its path. But you know, so you have to you have to think about many things when you're building, but. Yeah. Well, but there were a lot of amazing achievements in building that cheese grater. I know it's, it's caused some difficulty. But wasn't there, I think there were two brothers who developed a system for laying a floor, a prefabricated pre floor. Hmm. And they had to do it rapidly. And, uh, you know, you architects will know better than I how this is achieved. But they certainly read the book and it will explain it to you. But a floor a week, they had, mm. were under a tremendous time pressure. Yes. And it had to be done, the, the concrete had to be poured and it had to be done so rapidly mm -hmm. and they achieved something remarkable. Now, I don't remember if it was the cheese grater or the gherkin, you'll tell me there was another building that was, uh, that has two skins, two glass skins. Well, that's becoming, e yes, becoming even more. Um, the, the gherkin, 30 St. Mary Axe, which is a Norman Foster building. Um, Foster's known for these just very forward thinking, wonderful, um, wonderfully structured, socially oriented skyscrapers, but that double skin, you're seeing that more and more. Oh look, here he is right now, hello there, Norman. <laughs> um, but you'll see that more and more because it just makes, it makes sense in terms of energy costs, where if you have an air, if you have an air barrier, if you have two layers of glass, you're gonna be able to um, uh, more efficiently control temperatures. But in the Shanghai Tower, which will come up, you'll see there's um, a double layer and the building is so massive that's what's happening between those two layers of glass is they have uh, sky lobbies. So the idea being that if you're on the 100th floor and you want Starbucks, you don't have to go all the way down to the bottom, you can go to your you know, friendly neighborhood village on the 80th floor, for instance, and get a coffee or pick up your dry cleaning. So, that, so what's happening inside, inside of skyscrapers is actually changing as well. And the technologies are changing what we have here at One World Trade is we have a concrete core. Instead of having steel columns around the perimeter. Steel columns, as we all remember from the original trade towers, you know, we had very, very narrow windows to block the view. So if you put, if, if the support of the building, the main support's in the center, then you get to have these amazing glass walls. So the views are spectacular. And soon to be opening up um, 
to you because the observatory at the top of the World Trade uh, Center will be opening next year. Yeah, we'll I know one see. of the other issues with the first World Trade Center was the sway. Mm -hmm. And many people were very much discomforted by that. Right. How have engineers refocused their energy to diminish the sway? Well, like everything, wind tunnel testing is getting more and more um, sophisticated. Um, the, the concrete core actually stiffens the building. The sway, interestingly enough, sway is as almost as individual as the color of your eyes. People experience sway, and it's not just the building moving, it's how you're moving in tandem with the building, especially the way your head moves. So that, because a lot of your uh, organs that sense uh, movement are in, are in your ears, right? So they, um, they have something called milogy that they, they, uh, they measure. And on a typical day, a giant building, all right, so let's take, let's take One World Trade because it's right there and we all know it. Um, on a windy day, that building will move three feet in either direction. I mean, people have this idea. The, the original towers were super, were soup, they swayed a lot. But this, this uh, the, structurally, they've, they've diminished they've, that. They've diminished I know that. that one term I read, and I'm sure it was in, the, in your book, was called confuse the wind. Yeah. That the That's glass is rounded in such a way to confuse the wind. Yes. So what a brilliant, delightful way to talk about that. Well, because wind is the great nemesis of skyscrapers. It has a number, you know, gravity is another one, but the wind, <laughs> yeah. Someone once asked me, you know, how can we be sure this building will stand? It's like, well, Mother Nature will absolutely weigh in with her opinion. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the, the bottom line. Um, but you'll see a lot of the new skyscrapers are wonderful curving, twisting shapes because what they're doing is they're breaking up the editing, editing, editing the wind. This is my friend Patrick from Germany um, <laughs> with this picture of the Ulm Cathedral. But we'll see, you're gonna see the Shanghai Tower and you'll see that. Um, and there's two others, actually the first cluster of super talls. But so anyway, the, the idea of confusing the wind is to basically break up the path of the wind. So the wind isn't hitting the building, it's actually going around. You know what's a good example? Grand Central Station. The information center, uh, kiosk right in the center, that is actually not just about telling you when you can get the train to Stanford. That is actually a means of directing traffic. You know, we're also in our own little worlds that if that information kiosk wasn't there, we'd be colliding all the time. It actually it acts like a stone in a brook. People go around it, people move around it, and that's basically what's happening at the top of skyscrapers. Hmm. Now, some of these buildings are, are being created in very challenging environments, places that have typhoons, mm. that have earthquakes, not just as a possibility, but a predictable occurrence. Yeah. What kinds of things, what kinds of engineering feats have to be achieved to build a building of this size in those kinds of environments? Well, I mean, all of the, the, the building has to be founded in such a way, it's interesting, it has to be um, firm but flexible, just as we all wish we all could be, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, it has to be, it's planted, they, these are planted down in the ground. I mean, they are absolutely planted, which gives stability, but then it's also designed in a way that it can, it can and take um, the shocks. Now, I, I can't, give you some of the more arcane details of engineering, but I do know that this, you know, designing for seismic um, conditions, for instance, is, is a specialized. And, and, and very deeply challenging. Do you know if any of the buildings have already withstood the challenge? Oh, yeah. The <laughs> Tor Mayor in Mexico City, which is the most severe seismic zone, that was, um, the structural engineer on that was um, Cantor Senek, um, at Rimian. Um, that is, that's already been through a major, a major earthquake. And the owner was inside the building that day and he called up Ahmed and said, didn't feel a thing. So, you know. Pretty amazing, yeah, pretty amazing. Now, many of these cities are, cities, I'm giving myself away here. These buildings have become cities of their own. Yeah. They absorb 
fantastic numbers of people who, as you say in China, have moved in from the countryside. Yeah. And they provide all the services as well as some residential mm -hmm. and businesses all in one building. Right. Tell me more about that. Um, what's I think what's so interesting about China is that you know they're starting, you know the reason the skyscraper went up in this country, 125 years ago, um, is because we were a blank slate. That's why it didn't go up in Paris or uh, in Florence. But what we're seeing in China, what's exciting about China is that it's similarly a blank slate, but they're able to build buildings that now are able to take advantage of the state-of-the-art um, environmental features. And so that's going to be the great, uh, great laboratory for new green architecture. One of the main things that they're doing, because they can, because they're building new infrastructure, is these skyscrapers are going up on uh, train lines. So it's possible to, you know, you're up in the tower, you come down, you get in your train, and they're high speed, so you could potentially have a business meeting two hours away, Come back, I mean, kind of scary to think that you'd never <laughs> go above ground, but in fact, it's, it's, that's, a, that's a wonderful thing. So it makes sense that the, these various amenities, so yes, there are offices and um, residential and stores. I mean, the idea is there, is that you're gonna have increased density. So you're gonna put more people on less space, but they're gonna, they're gonna be able to walk to work or go to school, walk to school. Are there any psychological studies of what the impact is on people who live and work in the same building and maybe never even leave? I don't know. Is anyone in that situation here? Just could wondering. be. Oh, excuse me. I'm in that situation. Um, I live in work. I'm just joking, but actually, I live and work in the same place. My studio is. Uh, but you leave. Yeah. I mean, you walk out, you get into your car, or you walk to the village. I mean, you can do that. But a person who, or families that, never leave. Maybe the school is in the same building and the, and the work, parents' work is in the same building and the daycare is in the same building mm. and all your shopping is in the same building and you never leave that structure. I just, maybe yeah. there aren't studies yet. And, and yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I, it sounds fascinating. I'm, I mean, I don't know enough about that to speak to it, but I'm sure right here in our own city there's plenty of people that are all squirreled away somewhere with their cats. And architects take into consideration, maybe we'll have some architects who'll speak to this, when you're developing a whole new landscape, when you build a skyscraper in New York or Chicago or London, you already have a very dense populated area with lots of other tall buildings. The buildings that are going up in the Far East mm. and in China have vast landscapes. I mean, you see mm -hmm. these buildings from miles away. It's a, it seems to me to be a different concept in right. developing. I think it was called biophilia. Was that, did I have that word right? Well, by feel is really a, a love of love of nature. Mm -hmm. That nature makes us feel good. So, really, more with the green buildings, you're going to get that. They're they're trying to bring in sun and fresh air and all those things that make us feel good. So they're trying. They're mimicking various natural um, functions in these skyscrapers. But in terms of these big, you know, lonely French fries like you know 432 Park that's going up now, that appears to be, you know. The, uh, the uh, I just think it's just a harbinger of the of the the future up there. It's it looks like a big French fry right now, <laughs> lonely French fry. But it's not going to be for long, folks. It's like I I look at that building and I think, wow, that is like reminds me of the ancient Romans who would go once they conquered a place. They put an obelisk down to let everybody know far and wide that this is ours. This is our well. It, it it'll fill in. It, it'll fill in. It'll fill in. Be a different yeah. experience. Yeah. Now, and the same with China. China's China is scheduled to spend something outrageous, like six trillion dollars in the next ten years on building, on infrastructure and 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 towers. So, I think they have eighty new super talls underway right now. Are you working on your next book? I'm working on One World Trade Center. Oh, okay. I was thinking about another book on super dolls before you get to. We're, we're going to get to One World Trade Center in just one second. Uh, yeah. One point I wanted to raise: these buildings, I, I know some are Leeds qualified and they are green, yeah. but they're enormous consumers of energy. Yes. Do any of the buildings actually produce energy? A number of them do. A number of them do. 
What's exciting about really truly exciting and hopeful about new skyscraper design is that the technology, first of all, there is, um, you know, engineers and architects often occupy very distant camps with the architects getting all the glory and the engineers, you know, crunching all the numbers. But now they're coming together because these buildings are so um, magnificently complicated that there is a real acknowledgement um, and a real, uh, a true collaboration that is being acknowledged. Let's put it that way. Um, they are exploiting every possible um, aspect of great height. So you can, you can use the wind. You can gather sun down because they, they are planted so deeply in the ground. You can gather geothermal energy. Um, elevators, they suck up energy going up. Oh, they produce it going down. You know, there's all kinds of things. A number of buildings in China, and this we're seeing this more and more and more, are, um, you know, designed to consume, not only not consume any net zero energy buildings, they are designed to actually cover their own energy needs and produce energy. But what's happening, China does not have a grid yet that can accept this additional energy. But that day is coming where these buildings will produce energy, and um, feed it back into the grid. Is and Mass Star City is um, another one of Norman Foster's babies, and that is that is trying to be a uh, a carbon neutral city, maybe even something more than that. Now here we do have a grid that could accept energy. Is there any? Are there any buildings in the United States that are producing and selling energy, giving energy back to the grid? Hmm. I think that there are a few, actually, and there are a few in the works. Um, and I'm trying to think if I can give you a very specific example. Maybe not, but I think there's some that are coming. It might be a criteria we want to explore for, for permitting new buildings. What's going to happen? Skyscrapers aren't actually, oh yeah. <laughs> People are saying, oh, World Trade Center, only 60% lease. That's awful. It's like, are you kidding me? Empire State Building. They used to call it the empty state building. <laughs> Nobody was in there for years, until they made this movie. And then this big gorilla filled up the tower. So anyway, um, what it, it, is, it is always more economical to build shorter. But that is changing. We're reaching a tipping point. You know, in terms of creating density, in terms of being, allowing people to walk to work or walk to school, and in places like China, where it's not a matter of it's not a matter of just creating identity, it's a matter of housing people, tens of millions. Um, different issues, different issues. Yes. Before we open up the floor to questions, yes. I really want to talk about one World Trade Center. Okay. As I said, you are the official biographer, and you've been working on this book now yeah. for about a year. I yeah, assume. well, a little longer than that, but yes. <laughs> okay. My whole life. Uh, it feels <laughs> feels like your whole life. Yeah. Now I know that you're coming down the home stretch. Yeah. What have you learned in researching this book that you didn't know before that surprised you? Oh, it's been, it's been stunning on every level, I have to say. There's so many remarkable skyscrapers going up around the world, but honestly, folks, you don't have to go to China or the Middle East to see a great skyscraper. You can actually see a state-of-the-art, cutting-edge skyscraper right a few blocks up the street at, at World Trade Center. It is absolutely the state-of-the-art skyscraper that exists right now. And what's interesting is it's all very well behaved and it's glass, it's glass skin, right? What is important about that building is you, you cannot see. It is setting the standard for safety and security in skyscrapers around the world. And what's so amazing is, when they started designing that building, they basically dragged the New York City building code into the 21st century. Um, and they were, they were designing a building for which there were no codes. They were creating codes, and they actually changed the building code. Um, so a lot, of the, um, a lot of the security measures, the safety measures, the way it's been constructed, it just has changed so many things. Give us an example of one or two uh, dramatic changes in the way this building is constructed. 
Well, um, first of all, the concrete core. Usually, there would be more, there would be, uh, in New York City, there are a lot of union rules that govern how a building can be built. So you'd have uh, a steel frame building. The original trade towers were steel frame. Now we have this, we have a concrete core that allows the, the spectacular views, as I, as I said. Um, another tragic um, understanding from 9-11 was that there wasn't sufficient egress. You know, there, there weren't sufficiently protected communication systems. When you say so, egress, let's just say stairways. Stairways. Are so much they, wider. So th much wider. Basic things. Much wider. They're, they're lit. There are dedicated um, staircases and elevators for uh, firefighters and police. There's, there's areas of refuge. And so what's happening is all these things that that building has pioneered, actually, they were actually pioneered in Seven World Trade Center. This is surprising. I did not realize that Seven World Trade Center actually is the prototype for One World Trade. So they worked out so many issues at Seven and then made the, the new Seven. The new Seven, yes, also by SOM. Um, so the, but the, all those, all those um, new ways of thinking and new ways of getting people in and out of a building safely, those are already being exploited and abroad, changing skyscrapers all over the world. Now, and it's, it kills me because you know it's really easy to criticize the design of One World Trade. And I think you, when I hear this, I think you don't know what you're talking about. Well, what kinds we of should all be wearing like One World Trade t-shirts <laughs> saying, what I know what's here? inside. But why, what kinds of criticism do you hear? Uh, things about the size of it. I, the only thing I've heard in opposition is the magnitude, that it's enormous. But it It's is. enormous. Okay. But it had to be enormous. It had, this, this building had to, it had to deal with everything that Mother Nature would throw at it. It's the strongest building ever built. But it had to deal with, there were so many stakeholders, there were so many people that it had to answer to. I mean, um, People don't, don't forget, after 9-11, there was this incredible, for architects, if they hadn't gotten that much attention in, in, in 100, well, since the Chicago Tribune competition, you know, there was like everyone was talking about architecture. And there was all these wildly hopeful and fantastic and unusual and crazy, I mean, every kind of architectural scheme you can imagine. Um, so because 9-11, was felt so individually, so there's the cocoon, uh, so personally by all of us. Whether you had an immediate loss or a woundedness by being um, a New York native, or you were out in Colorado and experienced in some other way, or you were in you know East Africa and felt it there, you know, everyone had a response. Because I wonder why people are very free to offer an opinion about that building and come to find out, oh, they've never actually been you know, downtown. So I think my only thought is that people took 9-11 so personally that they also feel they are able, they feel um, you know, able to comment on this building, there was this building that is a replacement. Now, One World Trade Center is just one of many buildings in that right. complex. How well, many buildings are there? Well, there are nine major structures. Are they all complete now? or No. Unless you've heard something I haven't no. heard. <laughs> but they're going. They're going. They're opening, you know. Um, it was a very, very big deal to get that memorial. The memorial opened in time for the 10th anniversary. But you have the museum. You have two, three, and four. World Trade Center. Larry Silverstein is developing those. Then you have um, the, um, you know, Snow Edis Pavilion, you have Liberty Park, you have Calatrava's Transit Hub, and then you have this little illuminated Greek Orthodox Church. Buckle your seatbelts, folks. Wait till that church opens right on the corner of the World Trade Center site. That's, there's going to be some fireworks there. Um, but what is so amazing about that site, even though we have these separate structures, and there's been lots of contention and lots of talk and lots of politics, and we all know all that, Underneath, it is a virtual Rubik's Cube. Every one of those buildings is dependent on every other building. They share foundations. They share mechanical systems. It is extraordinary. So however people are playing, nicely or not, above ground, below ground, 
They're absolutely depend on each other. And I think it's such a wonderful metaphor for that side. Now, before the building even opened, we suffered a tremendous challenge, Hurricane Sandy, Superstorm right. Sandy. Right. What happened to the then still be in the works Trade Center then? How, um, how much damage the, the, did it suffer? No, it, didn't, it didn't suffer a lot of structural damage. There was the water, you know, there was water damage. The museum was, had, was full of water, but it structurally, no. Did it change any of the plans or any of no. the projects that had no. been completed? No. no. They felt it would withstand uh, another challenge of that. Yeah, it was. That was not the dish. It was, obviously it was a terrible cleanup, but it wasn't. Okay. Okay. Structurally, it wasn't an issue. Okay. Well, I'm sure that our audience has some questions for you, Judith. Are you ready Thank to take you them so on? Much. You're oh, yeah. welcome. It's always a pleasure I love to talk to all these people. Okay. <laughs> Who has questions? Thank you so much. Uh, from an economical standpoint, mm. how tall is two towers? Are you talking about building uh, affordable apartments, not like the one super splendor tower in, in Park Avenue, but for instance, in, for countries like China and Mexico, where you need to bring higher density to cities. Right. But if you build too big, you need to pump the water all the way up and elevators. Right. And so how tall is too tall from the economical standpoint? And another question related to this is um, talking about modular construction of prefab. There is a new building in Brooklyn. There is going to be 34, something like that, story high. There's going to be prefab. Right. Is that possible uh, to build a skyscraper in a factory? Not like they are doing in Brooklyn? Yes, I think it is. I mean, obviously. It has to be structurally sound, but it would make sense to create uh, modular units that could be then placed together. You know, when we were talking, when we started talking about the windows, for instance, those are all those are all modular units that are part of a larger system. The steel structure is all modular; it's all part of the system. Um, as far as what's too tall, you know, a building that a building you can't fill is too tall. You know. It's, it's more economical to build 10, 10 story buildings, you know, at least short term. And it's all, it's all relative too, right? If you have a severe housing crisis, then you know, you're gonna want to go taller. You, the market needs to be able to bear um, and absorb additional space. So it really depends. As to the question of the prefab, I think if you look at the construction of the cheese grater, I think that was largely prefab. That's the cheese grater in London. And uh, actually, there was a very good PBS special uh, that featured that. And you could find that. And mm -hmm. I think it'll demonstrate some of the techniques that were used there. And the floors were just part of it. Mm. Well, yes. one, one might mention the China Broad Group in terms of prefabrication um, in Changsha in right. uh, China, because there is a company that is building in concrete units uh, and has, has built many multiple 30-story buildings. And they make the point that they can build a 30-story building in one day. And if you go to their website, you'll, you'll see them do it. It's, it's quite amazing. Um, and they claim that they'll build the Sky City. They'll never build it. It would be, it'll be right. 220 stories tall, they say. It's, it's been received in the media as a, a credible idea. Right. It's, not, it's it's not. I mean, I'm you know I'm staking my professional reputation on, uh -huh. uh, on this um, because the interior of the building it claims to be a city within a city, you know, um, and they say they'll build it fast, but fast isn't really the point. The problem is it's um, a 220 story building with 10 million square feet in of floor space inside, mm. and there is no building in the world that's more than four million square feet. Mm. So it, when you say the economics of the, of the construction of prefabrication has really to do with the, 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 the return on investment, the payback. Um, and an interior space of 10 million feet isn't, uh, can't be well lighted. It has many practical problems. It has, uh, in terms of verticality, the elevator problems. But the main problem it has is too much space on the market at one time. Mm -hmm. right? It will never be built, even though it's possible Possible, probably to build it. Yeah. <coughs> yes, go ahead. Yeah, the, for a century, the world's tallest buildings had all been office buildings. But in the last, oh gosh, since the John Hancock building, 
they've become mixed use and the super tolls would have to become mixed use and self-sustaining mm. because uh, you talk about the Rubik's Cube, but even greater than that, the demand on infrastructure, the water supply, sewage, and you were talking about the transit hubs, transportation, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, you know, the journey to work studies that are done in the, you know, to gauge a building's impact on the local infrastructure is m mitigated tremendously by how much, you know, how many uh, services and uh, daycare, schools, whatever you have contained within the structure. Mm. I think, I, and you, you've probably seen this, that that is probably more the trend in the super talls. Mm. Um, I mean, you could not have- It's also a structural issue. Yeah. Because there's an office space, you need a big open space. Presumably, right. and smaller, but with the Burj Khalifa, for, for instance, the, the apartments are actually, act, it's a honeycomb structure that keeps that building on. But also when your elevator ride approaches your you know, commute to work, right? Uh, in terms of length, I mean, you can only move people, the World Trade Center elevators worked, uh, the original ones, 1,600 feet per, per minute. Right. Again, when you're dealing with a kilometer right. uh, in height, or you know, even half a kilometer in right. height, um, you know, it, all the transfers get to be the a air problem. pressure, the stack effect, and that right. sort of thing. Right. You would have to become. You'd have to have uh, certainly self-sustaining in order to fit into an existing grid. And there's not a lot of existing infrastructure. The, the trillions that the Chinese are pouring into that is because they have to. Right. They've also have have the you know the world's largest uh, high-speed rail network. Yes. Because they have to. Exactly. New York City could not exist without its subway system. Because you'd have to replace that with 400, you know, highway lanes and a two square mile, six story uh, parking structure. You can't have that. Exactly. exactly. So there's only a certain amount of places, and they're finally talking about mass transit now in the Middle East to sustain these huge structures. So there's these. I mean, we all—it's the obvious that we all know that these don't um, occur in a vacuum. There, there's exactly. a certain ecology that supports these. Yes, you need to have. Um, you need to have the infrastructure that can support the numbers of people that will live in these buildings. So Dubai, for instance, is uh, starting to be grow like a more, after frenetic activity, is starting to grow like a more normal kind of a city, but they are putting their money into a light rail system, into improved expanded highways, because they need, and they're expanding their economies, because it has to be about something more than oil. Well, the, the question, if out of all of this, yeah. is that in the 18 years and three volumes, four volumes uh, that you've put together, can you, do, you, do you see the trend of going from office to mixed use to uh, self-contained um, mm. as a, an actual trend in um, tall and super tall construction? I'm seeing more a trend, the trends that are, are interesting to me and are very obvious to me are the structural changes that are mm -hmm. happening and the, and the, um, in the, uh, the work on the far edges of sustainability, really. Mm -hmm. um, but what's always interested me about the Burj Khalifa is that its structure really um, depends on it being a residential mm -hmm. tower, for instance. That's the journey of the work studies. Yeah, yeah. But what they're doing is they're building these super cities, these super mm -hmm. satellite cities that, um, you know, 50,000 people, 100,000 people, where they're dense cities that are built around in China, built around bigger cities so that people can um, not live in a big city and can take a subway, you know, into Beijing if they need to, but that they can live somewhere where it's not gray and smoggy and somewhere Kabuzi is smiling. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. I have a question. Are the elevators now uh, tall enough to, to take one elevator to the top? Or must people Not still quite. Two Almost stories. two. Two still elevators. One. I think it was five we go five hundred meters and then there's a transfer. You know, it, for those of us who are old enough to remember what it was like to work in the first World Trade Center, um, I, I remember those days. And one of the surprises was how frustrating it was to work there. And it would take 20 minutes to a half hour either to emerge or to get up to your office. 
which created a huge problem for people who needed to do errands and things at lunchtime, as many of us have to do, mm. and because it would take your whole lunch hour to get in and out of the building. And then services started to come into the building. Banks came into the building. Stores came into the building. People could get lunch at, in the building without having to go out to mm. the street. And I wonder if you know, we do a little retrospective and look back at that as a learning experience upon which all of the newer buildings are being built knowing mm. that you've got to provide services, whether they're residential, but that's sort of the, ne the next outgrowth of it. Mm. Um, but you've got to be able to contain all the needs that people have who are working in those buildings, because it's just not realistic to think you're going to go somewhere yeah. and take care of all the lifestyle things you need to take care of, Yeah. besides working. Mm. Uh, yes, sir. Alice, you were just describing how a social lesson was learned from the World Trade Center. And Judith, I'm curious, these very ambitious buildings for the last 25 years or so, whether there has been a building that didn't confuse the wind as well when it was completed as it appeared to do in the wind tunnel stage or in the drafting stage, whether there's a building that has been as instructive on the engineering side as the World Trade Center may have been on the social side. That's a good question. John Hancock Tower. The Hancock is the first one that sprung to mind because that tower, you know, was infamous for its falling windows. Um, they've solved that problem. But I'm thinking, Carol, can you uh, think? Go from Western Building on 59th Street, mm. which is now the Trump right. whatever world something. Um, so <laughs> Columbus Circle, that tower needed to be re-engineered because it had so much sway. Um, right, right. And, and it's actually, yeah, Pentatonic did that building and fixed that. Um, I know there's been a lot of changes. That's a good question, though. I need to ponder that. Think about it. Yeah. Do you know some examples? Fortunately not. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, the, the City Corp Center, of course, is another case, but that, was, yeah. that, was an engine, that wasn't an engineering problem. That was a problem with the contractor. Yes. And that building was before its time. And what a visionary building, I think. But, but it's, uh, it's good to know that, I mean, as more becomes available to architects and engineers in terms of pushing that envelope, that uh, one building hasn't been constructed, fortunately. Um, my, uh, lay, my layperson's understanding is that prior to the age of skyscrapers, uh, the, lim the limitation on building high was the use of uh, masonry walls which could be made thick enough to support a building beyond a certain height. So with the you know, advent of steel frame, you could build higher. So I'm curious about the concrete core in one world trade. It can't be the only element of support in the building, right? It's gotta be some kind of lattice of steel yes. structure within. Yes, there's like our rigging structures that hold it up. It's not, it's not a, um, the concrete core is a, Oh, you know, it's not like a Romanesque, you know, church. It's not it does it's <laughs> thick, but it's thick for security reasons. Well, it's, it's not it has steel rebar in it as well. Right. It's a re right. reinforced concrete by, by substantial steel rods that um, in which yeah. the concrete is poured so that the um, tensile forces of steel can marry the compressive forces that um, that concrete bears. So it's a it's a perfect combination. Yeah. But it's, your point is, is exactly right. You know, what happened was walls kept on getting thicker and thicker and thicker and thicker. And so, um, you know, which is why we had those flying buttresses way back in the day. So skyscra skyscrapers are fascinating in that they really are, um, show us where we are with building technology. Because they're so extreme that they really are uh, cutting edge. Really quite fascinating. They're, mo they're fascinating markers, really, of social issues and finances and who's got the power. You know, it's just interesting. When do you expect your book to be published on One World Trade? Oh, next year, Little Brown. And I'm so excited about it because uh, it's, it's going to be fun to teach people and tell people and share with people all the things I've learned on this journey. Yeah. It'll be more about the construction of the building, so you want to make sure you look for it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. Do you have any ideas to why the French fry building, which can currently be seen from everywhere, is so plain? And 
<laughs> well, I actually think the design is kind of intriguing. That was quite it's, nice. Well, it has this minimalist grid design, right? It's like this perfect 10 by 10 grid that goes up and up and up. And I think it's actually genius, the design. Because what does the design tell you? It doesn't have the classic articulation, right? You know, the base, the body, you know, the cap. It, it has this promise of endless growth. It's like Jack and the Beanstalk, where it's just, it's all one fabric, and it looks like it can go up and up and up. I actually kind of love it for that reason, but it'll have company soon. <laughs> Judith, do you know, is there a preference when people rent space in these buildings? Do people prefer to be on the higher floors first? Do they fill up from the top down? Well, I think so. I think there's a lot of bragging rights. You know, if you, if you have the 95 million hanging around, you can buy a penthouse. I mean, if you're going to be in a tall building, I, you want to be in the tall, the tallest. Of. And a lot of them are tailor tears. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are bought, you know, for investment or for, you know, just as the pied a terre for, you know, OPEC or what have you. Yeah. Right. You want to be at the very highest point, right? But you look at the pricing structure, and that tells you. Yeah. How the higher. It's but not when these things get rented. It's what they rent for, or sell for, rather. But even yeah. in the buildings that uh, are largely commercial for office space, is there still the preference to be on the top floors as opposed to the... Post 9-11, post there was debates on both sides of that. You know, you couldn't insure it. People wouldn't want to work there. And then the others would say, damn straight, I'd go to the top. It's, I mean, there's a litany on that. It, there are people with very short memories, mm -hmm. you know. I mean... Well, there was a pause after 9-11, yeah. and it just, and then, you know, there was another pause in, in 2008 when, you know, everything went bust, but, you know, people are building again. People are building tall again. But it, it goes back to the, the question about the social use of a building. There's still 25 million Americans who refuse to fly. Right. You have a better <laughs> chance of getting killed on the drive to the airport. Right. Um, but, again, you know, who will, you know, a, a corporation has to decide, you know, some of their workers may not choose to work on a high floor just as they may lose workers if they relocate to another city. Right, right. So there are, I mean, there's just myriad factors. You know, every single person that I interviewed for my new book on One World Trade, I asked them, do you feel the building is a target? And every one of them, whether it was an iron worker or the head of the Port Authority said, yes. But the fact is, there's another truth. You're vulnerable, you're vulnerable wherever you are. You're vulnerable when you walk outside. You're vulnerable inside your house. You know, you could slip on a toy truck. You know, it, it's, it's the, there is a decision has to be made, and a lot of us will risk that is taken. There's a reasonable risk every time you leave the house. They were the nuclear target for the entire Cold War, and now for the war on terrorism, we've always been that magnet for, you know, the James Bondy-esque threat. Mm. I was going to blow up New York. One of those things. Exactly. You know, yeah, I'm actually flashing back. When I was a little girl, my father, who was a scientist and as nutty as a fruitcake but very brilliant, <laughs> decides that he is going to build a fallout shelter mm -hmm. in our backyard. And suddenly we had no backyard, but we had this grand enterprise going on that went down like three floors. So I'm wondering, it's just funny, I'm thinking, you know, how did I get so interested in skyscrapers? It might have been that, because I was a little kid, and then suddenly we had no backyard. We had like a space as big as this room going all the way down. But the Trade Center was target. You were talking about the people who had never been downtown were somehow stakeholders in it. Yeah. New Yorkers, we oriented ourselves. Get out of the subway, Trade Center South. Right. There was an article just uh, March 31st, 2001 in the New York Times <coughs> that said New Yorkers are finally getting used to the Trade Center. Yeah. You know, it, it just finally grew on us. But it's international symbol to the immigrants, the way, you know, it replaced the Statue of Liberty is why it was targeted. Mm. So again, when, and now it's the Arab world, it's the Asian world, which is now taken over the mantle of, of using these iconic structures to mm. define their civil, the success of their right. civilization. Right, Puts you on the map. Mm -hmm. A little different in China. Absolutely, mm -hmm. keep on thinking, oh, well, there's, there's the roof of, one of the roofs of the Burj Khalifa. In, in the Middle East, in, 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 certainly in Dubai, they used it. They used the skyscraper, the Burj, as a, in its cl most classic way, as a means of creating instant identity. Petronas Towers, Kuala Lumpur, where is that? Oh, now we know, because it had the world's tallest buildings for a little while. So 
It's a little bit different in China, even though they made that big splash in 2008 at the Olympics with all of the spectacular brand name buildings. Um, they also have a housing need. So it's, it's a little bit different there, but um, it's a way of creating instant identity. One is probably unfair, but do you have a favorite building <laughs> and why? And then 75, so it's not your favorite. And then the second, just, can you just talk about One World Trade Center at the top was redesigned. Or in, even in the model here, it looks different. The radar. Um, so what happened? Was that really a value engineering? Was it? <laughs> I, I was just curious. It just changed the design to me. But yes. OK. Yeah. You know, writing about the radar, I wish I could divide my book into three columns. He said, she said, what was built. You have to get everyone tells me the real story, okay? But basically, um, SOM had designed that, 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 that topmost structure. It's a three-story communications ring with the 404-foot um, spire, all right? That was to be enclosed in a fiberglass and steel structure known as a radar. You can actually see the model of it. <laughs> <laughs> is, it is it right here? Yeah. Wait, where is it, Carol? I didn't it's in the, the case on the yeah, Oh, in the way back. Yeah. Okay. The um, <laughs> so the, um, that, that spire has a very, the, the, the communications ring, which is that three-level structure, and the spire has a very practical use. You know, just as uh, the Empire State Building, just as the original trade towers had broadcast equipment on top, that was basically designed to support that broadcasting equipment. Um, and um, once um, the Durst organization came on board, they said, you know, wait a minute, some of these things aren't that practical. That if there is a radome structure enclosing this, um, maintenance workers, people making periodic you know, inspections of the structure aren't going to be able to get easily get in to this radome structure. And that is why that radome was taken, taken off. Mm -hmm. Now, it would have been, oh, that's too bad in terms of SOM's efforts, which were extraordinary. I mean, they, that was to be the masterpiece of that tower. But um, there, there, was, there was no way to maintain that, there was no way to maintain this that structure. At least that is the, um, I would say that is the official story. There are radomes on top of um, all kinds of skyscrapers. There's a radome on top of the Wills Tower, the former Sears Tower, but, Sarah, but Carol managed to get it named after herself. I don't know how you did that. <laughs> but there's radomes on top of that. Radomes are actually, are actually pretty common. But, so what happened was, does everyone know that the George Washington Bridge was supposed to be covered? That was supposed to be faced in pink granite. And, you know, Akma Aman, who was the, the structural engineer, had hired Cass Gilbert to create this fabulous pink, looking a lot like the Brooklyn Bridge um, facade. And so that, that steel structure was overbuilt in order to hold the weight of that stone. Then the Port Authority said, too expensive, it was going to cost $2 million, which seems like coffee money at this point, right? Um, <laughs> Port Authority, of course, even the depression, right? Um, Port Authority says, nope, too expensive. We're gonna, at some point, maybe we'll put, that, we'll put that facade on. And now, of course, everyone looks at the George Washington Bridge as, you know, this great modernist statement, and, you know, Corbu was saying architecture seems to laugh here. So <clears throat> you could look at the exposed spire in that way. You could also say, um, I know the structural engineers would have designed it differently if they knew it was going to be uncovered. And all of this was a very big issue that was so finally s solved last year at this time when the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat, what the issue was, they were afraid that if this was going to be just a mere antenna and not a spire, not an integral part of the building, it wouldn't count towards its overall height. And so we would not only not have the tallest building in the, in the nation, We'd have the third tallest. We'd be actually behind Trump Tower in Chicago. But that was, they decided, um, for lots of reasons, decided last November that that antenna would count. Now, I actually kind of like it. I like that we can, there's so much that's remarkable about that structure that we can't see, that I kind of love being able to see at least a little bit of it on the top.
Okay, one more question. Okay. You didn't answer about your pain with Bill. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? This is going to say, in my favorite, I have to say, is uh, City Park Building. I have always loved it. I have always loved it. I love what it stands for. I loved what it tried to do that it can't do. I love that the church at the base said, we're not leaving. So they built over it. I mean, it's just really, you know, um, I've always loved that building. But there's a lot, I like, you know, I like a lot, I like a lot of them. Judith always surprises me. <laughs> I like the Chrysler, you know, who doesn't love the Chrysler? I mean, you know, they're all, they're all good. About the city court building, yeah. the damper at the top of it, how does that technology catch on for other yes. small buildings? Yes, most certainly did. But I think, maybe Carol, you know this, that, that, that slanted top, that was going to be solar panels, I believe, right? Wasn't that going to be an energy collector originally? I think that's how Stubbins envisioned that. So it could be it could be fitted with it could be fitted that way, but yeah, that was that was. Um, it, it was designed to anticipate the technology. Yes, well, it was no, a visionary. I, I, guess I don't mean the, the, I'm talking about the. You're way. talking about the two mass damper. Yeah. That yes, right. that was that was that was absolutely cutting edge technology. But did that? How much did that catch on? Oh, it did, definitely did. Okay. Oh, it absolutely, absolutely did. Type I, I know. It's going to say. Type typing 101, which was the world's tallest for a while, You're right. the beginning of the 21st century, um, has a, a big gold ball, which uh, it, which is a tuned mass damper, and, uh, and and you can go up to the observation deck in order to watch it. Yeah. There's a picture of it in the book. If you want to see it afterwards, I'll show it to you. It's kind of like the great eye at the top there. The right. Okay. Anyway. All right. On that note, I'm going to thank you so much. Thank you. It's always oh, thank a you. pleasure. Thank you. As you can see, I've a, a, tall, a mega tall in terms of, of books. It's also a mega seller in terms of it, uh, uh, total number of copies. But I, last time I read a press release was like over 150,000 or something like that worldwide. I oh, that's, know what the number that's, is. that's history. <laughs> that's history. <laughs> that's right. It, I mean, it's more than this. It's a lot more than oh, that yeah. now. It's, it, well, you know, people love it. <laughs> Well, that's what we're going to talk about because um, as you'll look inside, and I hope you'll, you'll buy um, later, um, this is the color version that's really quite extraordinary of a book that started out in, in black and white. Um, and each building gets its own featured page uh, with exceptional photography uh, and um, uh, a type crazy that also includes things that are unusual in a lot of books that aren't professional books about architecture, things like sections and plans. Um, I know that when I did um, my book on, on the history of New York and, and Chicago skyscrapers, uh, it, was the, it was one of the first books to include floor plans in it, surprisingly. But how can you tell the story of a building that's about real estate um, without showing, without considering what happens inside? So. Um, so I guess we're on the same page in, in terms of, the, of our interest in skyscrapers, certainly, and the way that we think the story should be told. Um, so what we have tonight is a conversation between Alice Bloom and Judith Dupre. Um, Alice is a, uh, a, a, cable, a cable show broadcaster of a program which is called a town and a village too, cable broadcast, which is um, broadcast widely in the metropolitan area. She uh, both produces it and is a host on a whole range of topics from arts and culture to politics and planning. And uh, because they are friends and they've had conversations about the book and about, uh, about I guess, life and cities, uh, <laughs> that it seemed like, and by Judith's request, a, a conversation that would uh, talk about motive and research and all of that is, uh, is, is going, is, has been planned. So I'm very eager to see what uh, will unfold. And so here's uh, Judith and Alice to discuss. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.